name is Austin Buckles. I'm the sales manager over at DB Sales. Welcome to another DB Sales and Service uh, presentation uh, weekly webinars. Uh, we do this uh, every week on Thursday at noon on various topics. Um, this week we have steam generation system design presented by our uh, president, uh, Steve Mertz. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to um, uh, ask them in the Q&A um, window and um, either Steve himself or one of our panelists will answer it for you in writing or we'll take um, uh, a short uh, tangent and answer it live. Um, but with that, um, I will hand this over to Steve Mertz to get the presentation started. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Austin. Uh, make sure I have myself on muted here. I think everybody can hear me. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate the uh, opportunity to share this time with you. And, uh, spend some time going over uh, some of our uh, uh, steam generation system design. And uh, if you do have any questions along the way, as Austin said, feel free to uh, ask them and uh, we'll see what we can do to uh, address those questions best we can here as we move through the presentation. Uh, thank you all. Uh, so first, our presentation overview. I uh, usually start with talking a little bit about our history uh, DB Sales and our company and corporation. Uh, and we've talked a little bit about why we use high pressure steam. Uh, then go over to some of the steam boiler design codes, review different boiler types, and talk about a combustion, uh, burner types, efficiency factors, uh, types of combustion controls, uh, feed water pumps, because we got to get water into the steam boilers, uh, types of feed water equipment, water treatment, boiler blowdown. Uh, the ASME Section 1 boiler valves, economizers, and uh, then we'll go into our conclusion and take any questions. But if you do have questions along the way, we can address them at that point as well. Uh, for our history, DB Sales was founded in 1978 by Dean Grain, uh, and he ran the, co the company uh, up until 2010 when I came in as part of the long-term transition uh, and acquired the company from them and acquired the assets of the company from them. And we've been running the company under this management group since 2010 uh, and continuing to grow it uh, exponentially uh, most years. Uh, we continue serving the industrial and HVAC community uh, since 1978, our corporate headquarters, located in Garden Grove, California. And we have uh, really representatives throughout Southern California at this point, uh, continually adding new manufacturers, uh, a new stocking warehouse of boilers, valves, parts, uh, and all kind of other things that we have here, building skids and things like that. Uh, these are a list of some of the manufacturers we represent. We will kind of review some of these in uh, uh, different times here during the presentation. Uh, Burnham Commercial does our fire tube boilers. Johnson does our ultra low NOx burners. Uh, Rico does steam to water heat exchangers. Uh, Ace does clean steam generators, steam to water heat exchangers, tanks. Uh, Brian Boilers does uh, you know flex tube pipe boilers. And just a list of all uh, some of the, all the other equipment that we have here uh, from boiler venting. Really, you know, we have basically everything for your boiler room that, that we can supply. And uh, we'll go over some of the where some of these items fit during the presentation. Uh, we'll be talking about some of our high efficiency steam boiler systems today. Uh, why do people use high pressure steam? Uh, there's basically 883 BTUs per every pound of energy released when 125 PSIG of steam is condensed or when we go through that phase change from turning live steam back into water or condensate at that point. A uh, six inch pipe size for 24,000 pounds, uh, pipe size is about six inch uh, for 24,000 pound an hour of steam flow at 125 PSIG. So we can get a lot of BTUs through a six inch pipe, as you can see. Uh, that's why people use high pressure steam to deliver a lot of BTUs to a very concentrated area. And it's also relatively high temperature, you know, 125 PSI steam is roughly 360 degrees uh, at saturated conditions. So you have both a high temperature and you can concentrate a lot of BTUs uh, through relatively small pipes uh, and they can be used for multiple applications. Uh, people currently using steam for see mostly these days for hospitals, food processing, breweries, uh, chemical manufacturing, uh, sterilization, and high pressure steam is used in all sorts of uh, different things. Uh, we even still see some old steam radiators out there in, in different locations throughout the Southland. 
steam boiler design codes. Uh, the ASME code uh, section four is for low pressure steam boilers. Basically means up to 15 PSIG of a design pressure. That means your relief valve has to be set at no higher than 15 PSI on those boilers. Then we can be designed for ASME code uh, section four. You're really getting a max operating pressure of you know 10 to 12 PSIG to 10 to 12 PSI out of those type of boilers and maybe 13 if you really push it, but that's where you, the maximum for a low pressure steam boiler. ASME code section one is for all steam boilers above that design pressure. It's much more stringent on the NDE or non-destructive examination required uh, as far as x-ray, x-raying of welds uh, and other non-destructive examination, as well as all the boiler valves and other codes that come into consideration for ASME code section one. And again, anything with a relief valve set point or design pressure above 15 PSI is gonna fall into ASME code uh, section one of the pressure vessel code. Some of the other codes affecting uh, boiler system design uh, here in Southern California, we're, we're dealing with AQMD regulations on a regular basis and, and having to have those updated and you know follow those AQMD regulations, whether it's using a pre-certified boiler or permits for boilers. California Title 24 is the uh, energy requirements in the state of California and the energy code. California Title 8, that's the a fire pressure vessel code for the state of California. Also very important that we follow its guidelines and make sure that all fired pressure vessels in the state of California meet California Title VIII. Um, the Uniform Mechanical Code, Chapter 7, talks about combustion air requirements. The California Mechanical Code, uh, Section 304.2, talks about room volume requirements specific uh, for the state of California. Uh, chapter 10, we, we see the overhead clearance. Uh, we also have venting requirements. And then typically, uh, the uniform plumbing code also gets involved because we have gas and or oil pipe uh, to power the boiler with our fuel, uh, if it's a uh, gas-fired or oil-fired uh, type of appliance. Uh, then we also have regulator venting, uh, which also falls under the, the UPC or uniform plumbing code. First, we'll talk about some of the South Coast AQMD requirements. This is not the only uh, jurisdiction that we deal with here in Southern California, but probably certainly the largest and most well-funded. Uh, last we looked, they, the South Coast AQMD had uh, you know, over a $100 million a year budget, uh, with probably over 100 employees. If you compare that to some of the surrounding uh, air districts, they have more than all the surrounding air districts combined, uh, as far as employees go, and budgets for that matter. Uh, so we're typically dealing with South Coast AQMD. And South Coast AQMD encompasses Los Angeles County, Orange County, Riverside, and San Bernardino County, so some of the more populous counties here in Southern California. <clears throat> and then we also see some of the other counties that will just kind of piggyback or look towards South Coast AQMD and say, well, the boiler's pre-certified with South Coast AQMD. We'll also accept it, for example, in, in Ventura County or some of the other surrounding counties and some of the other surrounding air districts. So boilers in South Coast AQMD, boilers under 2000 MBH input require what's called a pre-certification with rule 1146.2. What that means is we have to send the boiler to a testing lab that's approved with the air district and run tests in, in, in accordance with uh, the requirements of the air district and fill out their form and submit those tests from the lab off to the air district and have that boiler then become pre-certified, we can also get an entire series of boilers pre-certified. Currently, the rules for under 2,000 MBH are sub-20 ppm NOx and sub-400 ppm CO. And a lot of the boilers we deal with under that level we have are, are pre-certified. Boilers from 1,000 to 2,000 MBH, uh, the A South Coast A can be actually requires these boilers to be registered. Now, they don't require you to pull a permit for these, as long as they're pre-certified, but they will require boilers in that size to be registered with rule 222. And this is more of a simple one sheet form that needs to be filled out and sent into the district with a, with a nominal fee, just registering that and letting the air district know that you have that boiler being installed at your facility and you will need to, to register and fill one of those out for every appliance that you're installing. 
or there's over 2,000 MBH input require a permit to construct with South Coast AQMD. You want to pull those permits as early as you can in the in the construction process to make sure you get locked in for what emissions are going to be required for your actual boiler uh, for that that project because uh, they can change the AQMD and we've seen it over the, over the years. The AQMD can change their regulations, uh, so you want to pull those permits early and get locked in with what the actual project is going to require and South Coast AQMD is going to require uh, from an emissions perspective. Then they're going to require source testing for emission verification after the boilers are installed and running. Uh, the AQMD is going to require a source test for emission verification to prove that the emissions that were guaranteed by the burner boiler package up front are actually met. Uh, and that source test needs to be submitted to the air Air board uh, for verification after the fact. You also need a totalizing non recyclable fuel meter. On gaseous fuels these days, we actually see South Coast requiring these non recyclable fuel meters to be both pressure and temperature compensated. And then it has to be non recyclable so that uh, the air district, when they come and do their inspections, can check and make sure to see how much fuel has been burned and then they can calculate how much emissions is being uh, given off by that facility. They also require emission test ports, two two-inch diameter ports located at 90 degrees along the circumference of the stack, and you have to have two pipe diameters of straight run before and one half pipe diameter of straight run after those test ports to ensure laminar flow in the stack for when uh, that emission testing is done. Uh, we have a couple questions coming in here, just uh, quickly address those. Uh, for Rule 222, uh, the fees are not annual, they're a one-time fee, uh, so it's typically just a registration fee uh, that you just pay one time for all those boilers between 1 million and 2 million BTUs per hour input, so that's just a, a one-time fee. And then another question, uh, the 2000, that, that applies to both boilers used in, in water heaters or uh, that 2000 MBH. So anything under 2,000 MBH uh, pre-certified, it, it actually it, it counts for water heaters, uh, like boiler type water heaters as well, or even tank type water heaters uh, under 2,000 MBH. Those need to be pre-certified with the local air district as well. So this not only applies to gas hard boilers, but this apply to boilers used in water heating applications as well, to, just to address some of the questions coming in there. Currently, for boilers over 2,000 MBH input, fire two boilers generating steam require seven ppm of NOx. This is a new requirement as of the end of 2018. The Air District changed this. It was previously nine ppm for both water tube and fire tube boilers. And now at the end of 2018, they did a what's called a BACT determination or best available control determination. And they determined that they felt fire tube boilers generating steam had proven that they could operate at sub 7 ppm so at the end of 2018 uh, the south coast a can be changed the regulation down to 7 ppm knocks uh, again but specifically for fire tube boilers generating steam is what the uh, the actual air district uh, requirements are water tube boilers at that level over 2000 mbh but below 20,000. 20 million BTUs are still at 9 ppm. Then when we get to boilers over 20 million BTUs per hour input and above, uh, the, the air district now requires uh, sub 5 ppm NOx. So that means that, and we can do this today even with traditional burner technology, if it's a, if it's a large enough boiler with a large enough furnace, we can, we can actually meet that sub 5 ppm NOx with, with traditional burner technology. Uh, not necessarily having to go to an SCR type of system, but that is another option going to uh, select a catalytic production. Because to guarantee 5 ppm knock, we're really having to set up the combustion on those, you know, the, the 3 to 4 ppm knocks, which doesn't leave, uh, you know, much, to, much room for forgiveness for sure. Now some of the other requirements in California, and this is California Title Eight. This is the Fire and Pressure Vessel Code in the state of California. So all fired pressure vessel, which a boiler falls under these uh, requirements, need to be designed 
and need to meet the requirements of California Title VIII. Uh, some of the things in California Title VIII for a steam boiler, for example, they require a, a high water alarm uh, be placed on all boilers. That is not a manufacturer standard, and it's not required in most other states, but in the state of California, the fire depression vessel codes, which is the California Title VIII requirements, uh, require that a high uh, water alarm be present and be installed uh, on all high pressure, on, actually on all steam boilers. And there's some other requirements as well for uh, redundant uh, low water cutoffs on high pressure steam boilers and on low, low pressure steam boilers. And then other requirements even for hot water boilers or even uh, hot water heaters or domestic water heaters because they're all fired pressure vessels within the state of California. One of the big requirements in California Title VIII is the requirement of a mandatory attendant for all high pressure steam boilers within the state. Now there is an exemption for this for miniature boilers, which we've affectionately dubbed California Special Boilers. And a number of manufacturers make these. We offer one from Brian. It's basically a 9.5 horsepower, which is the largest high pressure steam boiler you can have in the state of California that doesn't need to meet the California Title VIII requirements of a mandatory boiler attendant. So then you have all of these requirements, nine and a half horsepower maximum size. They limit the relief valve set point to 100 PSI. Again, that means you can operate typically in that 80 to 85 PSIG range uh, with your uh, high, high pressure steam set point. They require no more than uh, 100 square feet of maximum heating surface if you want to be dubbed as a miniature boiler or California special boiler. <clears throat> a maximum of 35 gallons of water in the pressure vessel. The steam drum cannot exceed 16 inches of diameter and the BTU input uh, per hour cannot exceed 400,000. If you meet all of those requirements, you can have an exception, an exemption, and basically be considered a miniature or California special, and be exempt from annual inspections and from the requirement of having a mandatory boiler attendant whenever you're firing your high pressure steam boilers. Uh, combustion air requirements, as most of our uh, steam boilers are, now we, we are seeing electric boilers and we do make electric uh, steam boilers. But a lot of the steam boilers we're dealing with are still gas fired. Some are propane fired. Some have backup fuel oil these days. We're talking about hospitals, prisons, or some of the other uh, types of projects that we get into where there's an emergency fuel requirement. Anything that's fuel fired requires combustion air openings. So the requirements are one opening shall be located within the upper 12 inches of the enclosure and one opening shall be located within the lower 12 inches of the closure. Uh, then the oh, size of the openings have to be uh, sized per table 7.1, 7-1, .1, and depending on whether those openings communicate directly with outside, uh, if it's a communicating through another room, then there's different requirements on how many square inches of open area are required for a certain amount of BTU per hour input. Uh, you know, the most common is providing two openings in an exterior wall with about one square inch per 4,000 uh, BTU per hour input. And that's if the appliance is in a confined space and you're obtaining air directly from the out doors communicating freely uh, directly with that outdoors. So that is one of the more common requirements and, and typically a lot of the ways that we see these boilers having louvers or ducts coming into the room that communicate directly with the outside. But there are different uh, options here you know, with different plenums or communicating through another uh, wall or through another space that doesn't communicate directly with the outside. Uh, then there's a different uh, requirement. So another requirement in the state of California from the CMC or California Mechanical Code are room volume requirements. Central heating boilers not listed for alcove or closet installations shall be installed in a room with a minimum of 16 times the volume of the boiler. This is very critical because it makes boiler rooms extremely large. Now, I will say that most Inspectors and most facilities do not meet this, but Oshpot really keys in on this. If you're doing a hospital, 
they really key in on these room volume requirements and make sure that you you do have these especially for that that type of a facility because the OSPO inspectors really key in to make sure that those room volume requirements are met. Now they do allow a reduction of up to 25 percent uh, when you use a force draft appliance. A lot of our steam boilers are force draft type appliance these days especially with the ultra low NOx requirements that we're seeing. So then that means you're really having to look at you know 12 times the volume of the boiler for the room volume that you're going to install those in. And one of the ways this really makes these rooms very large is if the ceiling height of the room is greater than eight feet of the volume, they calculate the volume just based on eight foot basis. And if you're talking about a large steam boiler, some of those boilers can be 12 foot tall, 16 feet tall, uh, especially when we consider economizer or some other add-ons in the back of the boiler. So to have that volume below the eight foot line within the room can really make some of these, these very large. Again, typically not enforced by a lot of uh, a lot of the jurisdictions, but Oshbot for sure uh, typically enforce that. Uh, where does it say in the code about the 16 times larger than the boiler? I'd have to get that specifically for you. I think I talked about which section that was in earlier. Uh, I'd have to go back and Andrew, I'll, I can get that section of the code for you here later. I don't remember it off the, the top of my head, but I think I have it listed there at the, the, the beginning of the presentation. Uh, in the California Mechanical Code, Chapter 10, uh, that talks about overhead clearances, power boilers having a capacity above 5,000 pounds an hour, or having a heating surface above 1,000 square feet requires seven feet of clearance above the boiler. Uh, steam and hot water boilers having a capacity above 5,000 or heating surface above uh, 1,000 square feet, or power boilers that do not exceed the above requirements only require about three feet clear above the boiler, or do require a three feet clear. Packaged boilers, steam boilers, and other hot water boilers not exceeding the above limits, and if they don't have a man away, only require two feet clearance above. Venting terminations. Again, when we're talking about a uh, combustion uh, fire boiler, you know, oil, gas, propane, whatever, you know, we do have to vent those boilers. We have to get the product's combustion outside of the room. We can't vent it inside the room unless it's, you know, if it's an outdoor boiler, then you just need a short substack or something like that. Uh, but when we have these boilers installed inside, we have to route venting to get the product's combustion outside of the room. Then we have venting terminations. Residential and low heat appliances, a vent termination has to exceed three feet above the highest point of a roof where it passes through, and two feet above any portion of a building within 10 feet. So if you have a parapet wall, anything within 10 feet, uh, you do have to terminate two feet above that with your stack. A chimney for a medium heat appliance must extend five feet above any portion of the building within 25 feet. Venting and chimneys must be properly sized to maintain proper draft at the outlet of each appliance. Again, on these big boilers, and especially these ultra low NOx ones, I recommend venting them individually if you can for sure. If you cannot, then we can always look at uh, you know mechanical draft systems, or at a minimum, really make sure that that vent uh, and that draft tolerance is going to be maintained at the outlet of each appliance uh, for proper combustion to be achieved. Some considerations of high pressure versus low pressure steam. You know, high pressure, again, in the state of California, there's a mandatory attendant requirement, which is a big requirement. Uh, you know, pipe sizing considerations. Uh, you know, low pressure steam has much larger pipe sizing requirements because you're sizing the pipe based on velocity, and steam is a compressible gas. Uh, your pipe sizing for low pressure steam is exponentially larger than for high pressure steam and transferring the same amount of BTUs. We also have steam pressure requirements, temperature requirements, things like that. If it's a, a certain process that needs higher temperatures, then you know you might need higher pressure steam to achieve those. Next, we'll talk about some of the different boiler types that are out there. Uh, the first type of boiler out there, which is traditionally used in, in steam boiler systems, is the fire tube type boiler. We represent Burnham Commercial. Uh, they've been making fire tube boilers for over 100 years. This is one of the companies we represent. On the left, you can see some traditional, we call Scotch Marine type fire tube boiler. 
Uh, they're available in three or four pass or some even in two pass these days. Uh, but that's a traditional fire tube type boiler. Very rugged, very robust design, a higher efficiency design. Uh, the more passes typically, again, the more efficient, but there's other ways to get that efficiency these days as well. The boilers are available in high pressure and low pressure state. On the left, we have what's uh, like more of a compact fire tube boiler, up to 100 horsepower, that's the Burnham C series, up to 100 horsepower, that's only available in low pressure steam or hot water designs. Up to 100 horsepower, that can go through a standard 3.0 type door. Even up to 200 horsepower, that boiler can go through a standard double door. So it's a very compact design. And it can be useful when uh, you're trying to get into some of the old buildings up in downtown Los Angeles or uh, anywhere where they have some high rises and you had limited access to get a boiler in and out for replacement. We've also installed a lot of those in, in breweries. Uh, this is a cutaway, and a fire tube boiler is really called a fire tube boiler because the fire does that, just that. It passes directly through all of the tubes. It's not rocket science why it was called fire tubes, it's really because the fire passes between the tubes. One of the nice things about a fire tube boiler, it typically has a completely water-cooled furnace. And as you can see, the furnace is completely surrounded by water, making it water-cooled, eliminating a lot of the needs for cord refractory or cast refractory which can degrade and damage over time. The other nice thing about a fire tube boiler is complete gas type seal. Each one of those tubes is rolled and or seal welded into the header on each end of the boiler. And then another advantage of a fire tube boiler, you have straight tubes and this boiler can be completely retubed in the field. If something happens with your water treatment, if you get oxygen pitting or uh, calcium buildup in the boiler, uh, you can completely retube this type of boiler. Uh, the old, you know, standard Scotch Marine type of boiler. Very field friendly for that perspective. Uh, some of the uh, advantages of a fire tube, completely water-cooled furnace, we talked about that. It's typically higher efficiency than a water tube design. No opportunity for furnace bypass, which is really good for ultra-low emissions design. We talked those tubes are sealed at the tube sheets on either end. One downside that we didn't talk about, if it's a hot water plant, in a 500 horsepower boiler, those tubes are about 20 feet long. If you start sending barrier and return water temperature water into a boiler with 20 foot long tubes, and those tubes are fixed at each end, those tubes start to expand and contract, and even just a little expansion and contraction could be an inch on either side, can lead to what's called thermal shock. So you really have to be careful in a uh, hot water plant using a, a large fire tube boiler like that, because you don't want to thermally shock the boiler start expanding and contracting the tubes and creating leaks. Uh, water tube boilers, we represent the Bryan boilers from the Bryan boiler family. Uh, they make a, a very nice, what's called a water tube boiler. And again, it's not rocket science. This is the water basically being in the, the tube. You have a steam drum on top, the mud drum on the bottom, the mud, they call it affectionately a mud drum because that's where all the gunk and uh, you know, sludge ended up on the boiler in that lower drum, if you will. And then you typically have a serpentine type tube design. Brian has a five pass design where you have fire going around the tubes and back circulating through, through, and through until you get to the exit here. Now this is like I said, a water tube design. The water is inside the tubes and then these boilers, the water tubes create a gas tight seal and also a, a completely water cooled furnace in this type of a design. One of the downsides of a water tube boiler is these are typically what we call tangent tube designs, which means each tube that creates that gas tile, gas tight furnace is just a tube on tube connection. So you just have no weld or no firm mechanical connection in there. You just have tubes that are fixed into the steam drum, tubes that are fixed into the mud drum, then serpentine design, and those tubes being placed right next to each other create that gas tight seal. Well, if that boiler gets shaken in, 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 in uh, transit to get here, or over time if those boiler tubes warp, you can get what's called short circuiting. And the gas is gonna, the gas or the fire is gonna take the path least resistance. If you get any warping in between any of these tubes, it starts to degrade your gas tight seal for your furnace, you get what's called short circuiting, where the fire no longer comes all the way down to the end of your furnace, it starts to take that path least resistance and short circuit through these tubes and it can cause a decrease in efficiency or even uh, not burning out all the uh, CO from your uh, combustion process, leading to higher uh, CO. 
this is an older version. Uh, Ajax used to make these in our factory firebox water tube boiler. You really don't see these around too much anymore. Ajax stopped making these years ago, but it was a type of water tube boiler that used straight tubes. Uh, nice from a service perspective because it had a lot of straight tubes that were easily replaced, easily serviced. But the downside of this type of boiler was always that it had a large port or cast refractory walls surrounding all of the furnace. So you get a lot of um, residual heat transfer through those walls and out, uh, you know, basically radiation losses into the room. The other downside of this type of design was that these uh, cast refractory walls could fail and need to be replaced over time. Uh, we got another, um, another couple questions. So another question back to the, uh, the volume of the boiler being calculated. Uh, it's not the volume of the tubes when they're doing that room. They actually do the volume of the pressure vessel itself. So it's more than just the tubes. It's the entire, the volume is calculated as the pressure vessel volume. You don't have to take into consideration the burner volume or some of the external insulation components, but you do have to calculate the entire pressure vessel when calculating that 16 or 12 times the, 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 the room volume requirements for that uh, 12 or 16 times the room volume. Um, another question came in, uh, how often should the tubes be inspected for warping or short circuiting? Uh, you know, we recommend, uh, in the state of California, you have to do an annual inspection on a, any high pressure steam boiler. Your insurance inspector, the state inspector has to come out. So I really would recommend at least once a year that you're expect that you're really checking those tubes, making sure that there's no warping or short circuiting going on uh, when you're opening that boiler up for your annual inspection. You know, you should be brushing the tubes, cleaning the tubes, doing a water side inspection, and at that point you should be really checking on a yearly basis to make sure that there's no warping or short circuiting. Now you can also start to see if there is any warping or short circuiting in, in a water tube boiler, that'll start to manifest itself in both higher stack temperatures, and if you're tracking and trending your stack temperatures over time, uh, which the stack temperature is always measured on our combustion reports and readouts, um, and we're doing typically tune-ups on boilers. We typically recommend doing tune-ups at least twice a year on a boiler. Uh, and you can also, if it's a larger boiler, above 2 million, uh, the eight air district requires quarterly monitoring. So you can really go through those reports and start to see if your, both your CO would start to increase, your carbon monoxide starts to increase in the stack, as well as your stack temperature will increase. That's a, a really good indication that you're starting to see some short circuiting in that boiler. Uh, but you should also have that inspected uh, at least on a yearly basis when you're doing your annual inspections. Water tube designs, uh, kind of the summary. In hot water designs, a water tube, well, especially a flex tube like our Brian, handles varying return water temperatures much better than the fire tube. That's why if you saw that bent serpentine design of the tubes, that acted like an accordion. If you had varying return water temperatures coming into that boiler, the tubes could flex back and forth. And that's why, affectionately, a lot of those water tube designs were called flex tube boilers. It is typically less efficient than a fire tube design. And over time, it can be more susceptible to furnace bypass, which isn't necessarily ideal for ultra low emission burners. But, you know, it's a perfectly acceptable design. You just have to you know, make sure that you're not getting any furnace bypass over time or any short circuiting in the furnace to make sure that the integrity of your your gas tight seals are maintained. There's also a vertical fire tube boiler. This is kind of a compact fire tube boiler, uh, basically a fire tube turned on its head. These are typically only smaller, you know, 100 horsepower, maybe 50 horsepower and less, just a kind of fire tube boiler that's available for steam out in the marketplace. Uh, we are even seeing these in hot water designs these days as well. Uh, next, you know, we'll talk about the combustion equation. Typically, when we're talking combustion here in the state of California, our primary fuel is natural gas, which consists of methane, and methane is CH4, as a hydrocarbon. Uh, so typically, our basic combustion equation, and we can burn oil, number two oil, amber oil, different things, as a backup or emergency fuel here in California, but only certain uh, facilities, such as hospitals and prisons, 
which are allowed to have an emergency fuel requirement. So most of our combustion really is that natural gas combustion. So that's our methane, CH4, plus oxygen, and this is a stoichiometric combustion equation, gives us nothing but H2O and CO2 after, the, after it goes through the combustion process. Now nothing is perfect and nothing ever is quite perfectly stoichiometric, but that's the basic combustion equation. Some combustion facts, about one pound of natural gas fuel burn generates about two and a half pounds of water. So in your combustion equation, at least when we're talking about natural gas combustion, about 12% of your energy is used to do nothing but convert this water that's created from the natural gas combustion process into water vapor, because it doesn't leave the stack at the elevated temperatures as water, it actually leaves as a water vapor. And typically a high pressure steam boiler, our stacks are elevated temperatures. You know, if your steam temperature on a high pressure steam boiler is 360 degrees, your stack temperature has to be above that, uh, unless you have some type of an economizer or heat recovery on the back. So your stack temperature in the 400 degree range. So that water vapor has been converted into, that water has been created and converted into water vapor. So that burns just 12% of your energy in that, that steam generation process. You used to do nothing but convert water into water vapor. So the only way to really recover that energy would be to go through a phase change and recover that latent heat. But you'd need some, especially on a high pressure steam boiler, you'd need some side of external uh, condensing economizer or something because of the elevated temperature of the steam. Another thing to watch out for is uh, excess air. Uh, the higher the excess air above stoichiometric means you know heating up more room temperature air to stack temperature, which means wasted fuel. And excess air can dilute the fuel gas composition, lowering its temperature and uh, decreasing some efficiency. Uh, by definition, you know, we talked about boilers and boiler designs earlier. A boiler really at its root element is, is really nothing, it's a heat exchanger. Converting heat from combusted gas or combustion into water or steam. A burner, burner by definition, now we're talking about burners, is really a mixing device. That's what it is, it's used to mix fuel and air, because air is required for combustion into a homogeneous mixture, and then we're igniting that mixture. So a burner is really a mixing device. Some of our burner's objectives. We really need to have effective mixing. We need to have a homogeneous distribution of fuel, air, and potentially FGR if we're using that as a diluent. Uh, we need an even flame temperature distributed throughout the furnace. And then we have to have that burner designed for a specific furnace. We have geometric considerations, refractory considerations, furnace pressure, fuel types. If all of this isn't taken into consideration, you don't have that homogeneous distribution, you don't have an even flame temperature, we can get what's called prop knocks or hot or uh, knocks generated from higher furnace temperatures. If our furnace temperature is hotter in certain points than it is in others, we can get certain higher knocks. And especially with our, especially given in California, with our ultra low NOx requirements, we can't have any hot spots in our furnace, any uh, things like that, any prompt NOx, because we have no room for error on our NOx uh, limits here in California. So we really need to look at all of those things and make sure that the burner is designed specifically for that furnace uh, and that we're gonna get even mixture. What is NOx? NOx is basically nitrous oxide. And NOx, N-O-X, um, is basically used to form all of the nitrous oxides compounds. NO1, NO2, NO3, NO4, all of those are considered, you know, basically aggregated and, uh, you know, taken into consideration as forms of NOx. Uh, the X on the end just represents it to be, you know, 1, NO2, NO3, NO4, but all of those are considered in that NOx family and need to be measured uh, but they're all aggregated when they're measured into a weighted percentage to be measured as PPM or pound per million BTU. NOx is a pollutant that contributes to smog, acid rain, uh, and PM or particulate matter within the, uh, uh, the air or atmosphere. And it can lead to poor human health. So we really want 
to eliminate as much of the NOx, which is a byproduct of combustion in natural gas or any carbon-based fuel, uh, lower and eliminate as much NOx from the effluent of the gas as possible. Uh, one of the solutions that we offer is from SC Johnson, which is the burner man, one of the burner manufacturers we represent with their Noxomatic. Uh, we have proven performance to even sub 5 ppm NOx uh, that we can do with a with given a large furnace diameter or a large furnace chamber, uh, and we've easily met sub 7 ppm requirements. Uh, these are available in dual fuel, they can be gas, propane, or even an amber 363 or number two oil as a backup fuel. Uh, it's more reliable than most all other uh, ultra low NOx technologies out there. It's a very proven design. We have over 500 installations here in California alone. Um, it's one of the most proven ultra low NOx burners uh, in California and in the world. As I said, we can meet the sub 5 ppm requirements for above uh, 20 ppm, sorry, above 20 million BTUs, uh, even without the need for selective catalytic reduction in most applications. Noxomatic is safe, it has a high quality fiber mesh, anti flashback design, and it's the best stable mixing. We're basically mixing all of the fuel and air and pre mixing it before it runs through the center of the, the uh, mesh firing head, and then we're doing surface combustion around the outside of that already pre mixed fuel and air uh, mixture that's mixed into a homogeneous. Uh, mixture and then we're combusting it on the outside of this firing head and surface combustion and this firing head allows us to get an even temperature distribution throughout the entire furnace so we're not generating any prompt knocks or thermal knocks uh, within that uh, combustion chamber. The Noxomatic V-series again this is sub 9 ppm we have even done sub 7 ppm on this uh, burner this is a that with their V-series that we're getting up to eight to one or 10 to one turndown. So it is a very high turndown burner. We have a number of installations out there. Uh, higher turndown helps you cycle less with the boiler. This what turns on and off less. It uh, helps with reducing wear and tear on burners, lower motors, uh, electrical components, starters or VFDs, uh, and even uh, igniters and things like that. This is our Noxomatic uh, Axial ULN burner. Again, you can see it's hinged here for uh, ease of service uh, and also being able to change out the element, change out motors uh, directly through this uh, hinged port here, making it for much easier servicing of this. Uh, and again, we, we can hit sub 5 ppm with this. Uh, the unique swing open door, uh, they do that this burner can do oil firing as well. And we can go up to 800 horsepower and even larger on, on these. We've done up to 1200. To even 1,300 horsepower on these. Don't see a ton of applications that size, but we come across them from time to time. What factors considered contribute to efficiency loss? Excessive cycling, like we just talked about. Low fire performance, basically having higher excess air levels at low fire than you do at high fire. Um, that can be a major efficiency loss, especially considering our boilers do operate at low fire or mid fire a lot. Dumb modulating controllers, meaning you know not having a PID loop and just really having a it's called like a pressure control or electromechanical type controller. Higher excess errors, standby losses, and electrical costs. Effects of excess air on efficiency. This is a, a chart that shows the, the difference between flue gas and room temperatures. So if you're not tuning your boiler on a regular basis, um, you can see the difference between, given our stack temperature difference, and this is the delta T between stack temperature measured and ambient air, if we have a 300 degree delta T there. The difference between 19, uh, between 6.5% CO2 and 9% CO2, you can see there's almost a 3%, at least 2.6% difference in efficiency just from having that higher um, percentage of excess air in the effluent of the stack. And this may be kind of hard to read for I'm trying to point it out. There's between 6% CO2, which is about, you know, 40 or 50% excess air, and 9% 
uh, given the same temperature. These are stack losses. That's seventeen point two percent stack losses versus you know twenty percent stack losses. That's a three percent difference in efficiency gain just from having higher excess air, which can have from depending on burner design or the burner's not getting tuned. We got a question coming in: uh, igniters with VFDs are the VFDs selected by the factory? Uh, typically, we provide like on the burners. We do typically provide the variable frequency drive with um, the the burner, but we do have options to use different VFD manufacturers, and you can obviously retrofit burners with different VFDs. Uh, if you want to put your blower motor on a VFD, that's something we can do in the field. It's something we can help with. If that is something you want to do in the field, yes, you can use different brands of VFDs. And as long as it integrates with the controllers that we have on the boilers, it's something that can be done in the field. Uh, we can either supply a VFD from the factory or you can use other VFD uh, manufacturers as long as it's a proven design, something that will interface with the controls that we're using on the boiler. Different boiler control types. You know, you have jack shaft, which is an old. Uh, you know, I've done my degree in mechanical engineering a long time, and we had to study cam and shaft linkages uh, back when we were in college. Uh, that's basically what a jack shaft was. It was a cam and shaft linkage, which was actually had a mechanical cam and linkage assembly where the fuel and air valves were mechanically linked by what was called a, a jack shaft or a, basically a cam and linkage assembly. And then, as one mod motor or modulating motor drove that burner from low fire to high fire, that jack shaft assembly moved both of those in unison along that cam and shaft design. Now to tune that boiler, you'd have to adjust that jack shaft because you only had one mod motor kind of driving both that fuel and air um, dampers uh, and controlling that fuel air ratio. Uh, much more popular now is what's called like a parallel positioning control. And we'll talk about these, a fully metered and then like an O2 trim type of system. Jack shaft design is basically the simplest type of combustion control for force trapped burners. Utilizes a single, single actuator for control, and then that use is mechanically linked to a cam and shaft design to control fuel, air, and even FGR ratios by having a long, straight shaft and on a cam that operates to control the position of those valves by one mod motor. Now, one of the things with these is they typically have very poor performance at low fire because of that cam design and that shaft design, typically made it very hard to control the excess air O2 at low, low loads. So it was difficult with repeatability, especially on the low end. Much more common now, especially with the advent over the last 15, 20 years of microprocessors and how cheap and how inexpensive, I should say, electronics are becoming over time, um, we have parallel positioning combustion control. This basically utilizes an individual actuator for the fuel, gas, and FGR valves. Controls are built with intelligent PID control for optimum modulation of fuel curves. Now, when we're using parallel position, we're going to set up the combustion in the field. We're really doing setting individual mod motor type positions, and we're typically doing 10 points within the control, setting up a fuel air ratio along those 10 points from low fire to high fire. But now we're able to send you know, direct signals to those individual mod motors to set individual valve positions for gas, for air, and FGR if you're using FGR. It makes for a much more um, efficient burner, especially at low fire, because we're able to control to that mod motor position with that and eliminating those linkages and camshafts. We can control the combustion air levels at low fire much better, giving us much better low load performance and also typically giving us much better turn down and much better operation and easier to set up. And then the PID control also allows for optimum modulation and fuel curves. We also have touch screens available. These are becoming very common. You can do touch screen interface uh, directly with the unit that can monitor oxygen, uh, combustion efficiencies, all different sorts of things. Uh, fully metered combustion control systems requires the metering of the air, fuel, and FGR flow rates. This would be actually providing flow meters on each of those. And taking it one step further, now we have uh, a mod motor on each one of the fuel, air, and FGR still. 
And now we're actually monitoring and measuring the flow of each one of those uh, makeup air, fuel, or FGR rates by flow meters to further enhance the accuracy and control. Uh, boiler water level control. On steam boiler systems, we gotta get water into the boiler. So how are the, what are the different types of boiler water level control? We can simply control water level in the boiler on off with like a McDonald Miller 157. Uh, basically when that float in that controller drops to a certain level, it sends a signal and then the pump turns on. Starting to fill your water with boiler, boiler water gets to a certain level, that float chamber, inside the chamber, that float gets to a higher level, cuts off that signal to the pump, turns the pump off. That's really the probably the simplest level of water level, or simplest way of water level control. Next would be a modulating level control. That would be basically using a modulating level control valve on each of your steam boilers, and then a proportional control on your boiler. That can either be a PID loop controller, it can be a McDonald Miller 193 with a, a slide wire sending a zero to 125 ohm signal out to a control valve. Uh, not the most precise way to do lot modulating level control, but certainly an effective way to do it. Or you can use a differential pressure transmitter on the boiler and monitor the actual water level through a, a, a basically a, a water meter uh, by using a differential pressure transmitter to, to measure the amount of water in the boiler taking that to a PID loop controller and modulating a water level control valve. In those instances, we use what's called continuous feed pumps, and those pumps are either run continuously or run on VFD to maintain uh, constant pressure in your feed water header. If you want to increase efficiency, we can put VFDs on those feed water pumps and maintain a constant pressure in that feed water. And then we have a modulating level control valve on each one of the boilers. Next, you have a two element level control. A two element level control, the first element is still the water level in the boiler from a water level transmitter. And then you're also getting a feed forward signal from steam flow. Basically when there's a lot of steam starting to come out the pipe, it's sending a feed flow, a feed forward signal saying, hey, there's a lot of steam coming out this pipe. I'm gonna need to start proactively opening my feed water control valve because at some point I'm gonna start, I'm gonna need more feed water because I have a lot of steam coming out of the pipe. The next would be a three element level control where there's both a feed forward signal from the steam flow saying, hey, I need to open my feed water valve because there's a lot of steam coming out of the pipe. I can see it from this steam flow meter. And then a feedback signal saying, hey, there's a lot of feed water coming into the boiler right now. I can see that from my feed water flow meter. Let's start cracking back and closing that feed water control valve. Um, and three element isn't really common feed water control strategy until you get into the larger industrial water tube boilers. That's where we'd see more of those types of uh, water level controls. Modulating level control on off in our typical smaller facilities are you know, very common. Feed water pumps. Now we need a, a, a pump typically to feed, especially in a high pressure system, to push water into these boilers. Uh, so feed water pumps for an on off pumping design, which is our, you know, just from a boiler turning that pump on and off. Uh, the pump is cycles on and off from the level control on the boiler. We size those pumps at two to three times the steaming rate of the boiler. So taking our steaming rate or our boiler horsepower, converting that into miles per hour of steam, dividing by 500, that gives us GPM. Um, and then taking that into consideration, plus the boiler blowdown rate and any, well, you wouldn't have a circulation rate on an on off pump, but then multiplying that by two to three times to make sure that the pump has more than enough water every time that kick that boiler kicks the pump on to, it can push enough water into the boiler. Now, a continuous pump, this is where we have the pumps are running and then you're controlling the water level in each boiler from a modulating water level control valve. These pumps, again, we're taking our steaming rate of the boiler, we're dividing by 500 to get GPM, and then we're typically multiplying that by 1.3 to 1.5 times the steaming rate, plus the blowdown rate and any pump recirculation, make sure that we don't deadhead or deadhead that pump, we meet the minimum recirculation rates. Uh, and multiplying that by a factor of 1.3 to 1.5 to come up with our continuous feed water pump sizing and selection. Feed water requirements for high pressure steam boilers. Any boiler having more than 500 square feet of heating surface on water site heating surface shall require at least two means of feeding boilers for high pressure steam, meaning the two ways to get water in that boiler or you may need a redundant pump. 
and that each source shall be capable of feeding water to the boiler at 3% above the highest setting of any safety valve on the boiler. So if you're, you know, boiler's relief valve set for 100 PSI, that feed water pump that you have needs to be able to put out at least 103 PSI to be able to satisfy the ASME code section requirement, the ASME code section one requirements for feed water pumps. Now we talk about different types of feed water systems. There are atmospheric tanks, deaerators, and we have both spray type and tray type. And general note, when we're doing these types of feed water systems, we typically have heated water in here, and if they're atmospheric or even if they're pressurized, we really need to take into consideration what's called MPSHR or MPSH required, which is net positive suction head required on each one of those pumps. Because as the water temperature gets closer to the steaming point, there's less MPSH available than water, which means that our tank stand heights need to be able to accommodate any of the MPSHA requirements, or sorry, the MPSHR requirements of those pumps, because the, there is no MPSH available within the water as it gets close to the steaming temperature, you really need to provide for that MPSH with a stand height or a, by another means. So, MPSH calculations, you have your static head, water level height, water pressure, atmospheric pressure times 2.31 uh, to give you the feet in absolute, subtract your piping losses, and then you need your MPSHA needs to be greater, or MPSH available needs to be greater than the MPSHR required on the pump at the required flow rate. And the pump's MPSHR will vary depending on the flow rate that you're using. So you need to look at the flow rate that you've sized for that application and look at the MPSH required for that pump at that application and that specific duty point. It's very critical when we're talking about steam systems because as I said, as that water pressure, uh, as that water temperature approaches uh, the steaming temperature, uh, as we do in a lot of the feed water systems we're dealing with, there's very little MPSH naturally available within the water. Atmospheric feed water tanks is a very low, low additional first cost, uh, can be utilized to uh, can utilize steam injection to remove some dissolved oxygen from the water, and are used to receive pumped and gravity returns, typically vented to atmosphere. Probably one of the cheaper types of feed water systems out there. Uh, and you can do a steam preheat. And it depends. There's different options you can put on for this. Next, we talk about a spray type of deaerator. It's an economical deaerator design. It's lower profile, especially compared to a tray type. Typically a pressurized design, but we also have atmospheric deaerator types. Uh, can receive high temperatures and pressure returns. And we can also do an option for duo tank designs, where you have both the combination surge and deaerator section built into one pressure vessel. What is a deaerator? A deaerator is a special type of boiler feed system that removes dissolved gases from the water physically, not chemically. And so why would we want to deaerate? Basically, if you've ever, one of the things I like to comment, if you've ever made pasta on the stove by boiling water in a pot, you can see when you start to boil that water, you put a pot of water on the stove, you turn it up to high, you see that water starting to get hot. If you ever start to observe that, you'll see all these little bubbles starting to form on the bottom of that pot. That is oxygen coming out of solution. The water that we normally get out of the pipe or out of the faucet at 60 to 80 degrees has a lot of dissolved oxygen in it. If you send that water directly into your steam boiler without removing that oxygen first, there is no dissolved oxygen in steam. So that oxygen is going to come out somewhere. If you do not remove it before you send it into your boiler, it is going to come out in your boiler. And if it comes out inside your boiler, your boiler is made of primarily carbon steel, it is going to stack, attack those carbon steel surfaces. So this is one of the reasons we do steam preheats on our uh, boiler feed systems, or we use a deaerator. It helps remove oxygen and carbon dioxide from that incoming water. 
It can protect the boiler from oxygen pitting, protect the return lines from carbonic acid, helps improve heat transfer because you're removing that oxygen before it goes into the boiler, because air acts as an insulator in the system, raises the feed water temperature, and reduces the potential for thermal shock on your boiler. This is our solubility graph. As you can see, water, water at 80 degrees has a very high concentration at atmospheric conditions. That's almost 800 part per billion of oxygen concentration in water at 80 degrees. Now, as water at atmospheric conditions approaches the steaming temperature, because as we said, in steam, there is no oxygen. There's no dissolved oxygen in steam. So as you can see, as this temperature of the water at atmospheric conditions approaches your steaming temperature at 212, all of the dissolved oxygen is forced out of solution. And really, we want to do that before it gets into the boiler, because that helps reduce oxygen pitting. Now, you can do this both chemically and you can do it mechanically. A deaerator is removing that oxygen mechanically. You'll still probably want an oxygen scavenger or an oxygen inhibitor injected downstream of your feed water pumps to pull out any residual, because the deaerator will typically remove down to 0 0.005 cc's per liter of oxygen out of the water. So there's still a little bit of oxygen left in that water. You'll typically want to get rid of the rest of that with a chemical. Now, the aerating greatly reduces the amount of oxygen scavenging chemical that you need, and is also much safer for your system. So how does the deaerator work? Basically, your deaerator takes a live chest of steam, as you can see our steam coming in here, takes water, our makeup of raw fresh water, and our spray type deaerator basically runs that through atomizing nozzles, atomizing that water into tiny little droplets, and running that over a chest of steam. And as you do that, those water droplets approach the steaming temperature of that water. And as that happens, all of the oxygen is driven, or most of the oxygen is driven out of solution, and it comes out through this continuous purge vent here at the top. Then we have our water level within the deaerator that comes down into our boiler feed water header, goes into our feed water pumps, and is pumped over to the boiler with the majority of the oxygen removed from it. And again, any residual oxygen would typically be taken care of with uh, an oxygen scavenging chemical downstream of the feed water pumps. A tray type deaerator, typically used in larger plants, is a longer residence time in the deaerator process, more effective at oxygen removal, and you can also get a larger turn down. As you can see, this is our tray type deaerator. You're still taking a large chest of steam and steam in through our steam control valve into the deaerator. Now our makeup water is being atomized still, but now it's being, the atomized water is dumped onto trays. This tray increases the resi residence time of how long it takes that water to come over that chest of steam as the water drips down over these trays, giving a long, longer residual time uh, and more contact time for that oxygen to be driven out of solution before the water comes down into our deaerated reservoir down here and then going into the feed water pumps and then being pumped into the boilers. Next, we have a surge tank. Surge tanks typically use the conjunction with a deaerator, and this would typically be used to receive low pressure returns, makeup water, and potential slugs of water. We don't want to slug a deaerator with a large amount of low pressure returns or makeup water at any one time because that's, those spray nozzles can be overpowered. There's a maximum flow rate that can hit those spray nozzles. And if you have a hospital or a food processing facility with eight different wings and you got, you know, maybe eight or 10 different remote condensate stations that might all decide to kick on at the same time, or even in a hospital with three or four wings, you might have a remote condensate return station in each one of those. If all of those turn on at the same time and you pump those directly back into a deaerator and they're low pressure returns, you can overpower that deaerator spray nozzle, which means that your deaerator spray nozzle will no longer be atomizing that water and those water droplets and may not get proper deaeration. 
So one thing to do when you have so many low pressure returns is to put what's called a surge tank, basically like a buffer tank, and then we pump all of those remote condensate stations and low pressure returns back into one location and we even bring our makeup water into there and then we feed it at a constant flow over into our deaerator, making sure that we never overpower that deaerator spray nozzle. System water treatment. Again, if we fed the water that you or I drink into our steam boiler, our steam boiler would be gone in six months. It's just, it's a fact of life. You know, there's calcium in that water, there's dissolved solids, and there's a lot of oxygen, as we talked about, dissolved oxygen in that water. So we need to start treating that. We already talked about removing the oxygen. The first way to remove the oxygen is with either a steam preheat or mechanical deaerator. Then we have to look at softening the water or removing the calcium from the water. Because again, if you don't remove that calcium, steam is pure. After that water changes phase, that H2O changes phase from liquid into a gas form, there's no calcium in steam. That calcium is gonna come out. And if you don't remove it before it goes into your boiler, it's going to basically fill up your boiler with calcium, which can cause clog tubes, decrease the heat transfer, or any other one of undesirable effects that you don't wanna have happen in your steam boiler. So we typically remove that um, calcium by using a water shop. The water softener goes through an ion exchange and removes the calcium from the water before it goes into the steam boiler. And you really want as low amount of calcium coming in there as possible because any of that calcium is going to be left in that boiler over time. It's not going to go out with the steam. Other things to watch out for is total dissolved solids. Those have to be controlled because those dissolved solids, again, there's no dissolved solids after that. Goes, the water goes through a phase change into a gas and becomes steam. So that dissolved solids will start to concentrate in your boiler over time. The other thing are chemical feed systems. And typically there's three chemical feed systems and three chemicals associated with the typical steam plant. Typically have an oxygen scavenger, which is injected into the boiler feed water tank or the aerator. A boiler descaling agent, which is injected into the feed water stream going into the boiler. And then an amine, which uh, helps neutralize the steam uh, because water that's softened and turned into steam can be slightly acidic, so you can use an amine injection into the steam line to slightly neutralize that so that you're not getting any corrosion or carbonic acid uh, anywhere in your system. It helps uh, eliminate some of that uh, by doing an, an amine injection into your steam line. Water softeners, now there's different types. You can use exchange tanks, or you can use like a duplex type tank here which backwashes the, the resin tanks over a brine tank. And you create a brine solution, which uh, basically recharges your resin tank. That typically takes 10 to 12 hours. So typically when you're sizing your water softener, each resin tank has to be sized that it can run for 12 hours before converting over to the other tank to start your, your backwash or your, your brine type solution and then recharging that tank. So you need to size each one of these tanks typically for about a 12 hour worth of operation. And you need to know the, the incoming water hardness coming in here um, to help control um, that system and help size that system. Now an exchange tank you'd basically be using, and we're seeing these in some areas like Irvine. The city of Irvine actually doesn't allow you to do backwash and brine anymore or, or uh, down. So like, you have to use uh, what's called an exchange tank where they actually give you a number of tanks into your system, you use those tanks and you have a service that comes out and exchanges those tanks. They take it off site and they uh, recharge the tank somewhere else off site. Blowdown, as we talked about boiler blowdown, we talked about total dissolved solids. One of the ways we control those total dissolved solids and how those solids build up on the boiler is by doing what's called a boiler blowdown. Now there's two types of boiler blowdown. The first is surface blowdown, and this is usually con controlling the, the, the total dissolved solids building up on top of the boiler, which form a, a skim, which accumulates on the water surface. And on a fire tube boiler, you can get to about 3,500 ppm of total dissolved solids in the water. Anything above that and the surface tension of the water because of that skim becomes too great. And then as your steam bubbles try to break through that surface tension, 
it basically leads to carryover where you're getting dissolved solids and actually uh, water droplets into your steam line, which can cause steam hammering and all kinds of other things that you don't want to happen. So like I said, on a fire tube boiler, that's right about 3,500 ppm. So you control that by basically taking a skimmer tube off the top of that boiler and running that through a continuous surface blowdown. And then you monitor the total dissolved solids or conductivity in that surface blowdown and open or close your, your, your surface blowdown valve to maintain below the concentration that you need to. Uh, typically, that can be done with a metering valve through uh, surface, uh, the continuous flow valve or a conductivity based surface blowdown control system, which monitors the conductivity of that water and opens and closes that valve to maintain uh, proper. Uh, TDS at the top of the boiler. Bottom blowdown, this is typically done once per shift, and a bottom blowdown is done to remove the sludge of water from the bottom of the boiler. So you basically open your uh, quick opening blowdown valve, and then open a slow opening blowdown valve and do your bottom blowdown both at the front and back. You would repeat that process, and that removes all the sludge off the bottom of your boiler. That's typically done, uh, as I said, about once per shift. Uh, now, typical local codes require a blowdown to be cooled to blow 140 degrees before entering the sewer. On a high pressure steam system, that water, as we said, about 350, 360 degrees. So we take this into what's called a blowdown separator. The water comes in here, drops to atmospheric conditions. So 360 degree water drops to atmospheric conditions. What happens is about 15% of that water flashes the steam immediately and cools that water down to 212. So the atmospheric conditions, water cannot exist at 360 degrees. It has to automatically drop to 212, and then a certain percentage of that energy uh, flashes some of the water uh, off the steam. The steam then runs out the vent. Now you have your 212 degree water in your blowdown separator. Come down through your after cooler. We typically have a temperature sensor here that would mix industrial cooling water into that stream so the effluent discharge into your sewer line is below 140 degrees. We had a question coming in on, uh, is blowdown required for both low pressure and high pressure steam systems? Yes, blowdown, uh, both surface blowdown and bottom blowdown is required for both low pressure and high pressure steam systems. So you need to make sure you're doing that if you have a steam system, whether it's low pressure or high pressure, you're still building up that, uh, those concentrations of dissolved solids, you're still building up that sludge on the bottom of the boiler, and you need to be doing your, your uh, surface blowdown and your bottom blowdowns. And typically, I said like the bottom blowdown, you're typically doing that about once per shift. Chemical injection, chemical injection is typically done through uh, like a metering pump like this with a small tank reservoir. Often we can have a mixer on here as well. If you're mixing that chemical with water before it's going in. Uh, now those recommendations typically come from the chemical company Typically, an end user co uh, contracts directly with a chemical company. Uh, we don't provide chemicals. We can provide some expertise, uh, but we don't actually uh, provide chemicals or that final expertise or that service. A chemical company would typically do that. And depending on how they're injecting it, they may have a mixing device. They may be mixing those chemicals with water and then injecting that uh, into the different locations through a chemical metering pump that they uh, control and. Uh, adjust to maintain proper chemical for your boiler system. Sample coolers, another part of the steam system. Basically, a sample cooler is a small heat exchanger connected to, um, and typically with these, you do have an amount of hardness. So typically, you're using soft water as cooling water on these, but then you can pull a sample off the top of your boiler, you can pull a sample off of your deaerator or feed system, and even off of your steam line, you pull that sample, it's kind of hard to work with that sample when it's 300 and some degrees. So you run a cooling water over this heat exchanger through your sample cooler, cools that sample down and makes it so you can work with that sample. You can then test it. You can test the, the oxygen content in there. You can check the dissolved solids um, and you can check the chemical levels in there. And, and typically like this type of a sample cooler is used very frequently in a, a steam system to help with uh, monitoring of all the samples that you're taking when you're doing your water treatment. ASME section one, there's also a list of vowels required for ASME section one. 
And ASME requires all piping up to the second valve on a high pressure steam boiler assigned with ASME section one. So all piping, all valves need to be on the boiler, need to be tested per ASME section one. When multiple boilers with manways are connected to a common steam header, what's called a non-return valve is required in the steam line. That non-return basically asks as a stop check. So if one of the boilers is running and the other is not, steam cannot flow back into that boiler. Surface blowdown and stop and metering valves are required. Double valves are required on the blowdown and feed water lines. And the feed water line requires a check valve when using a common header. So one of the reasons, um, basically on the steam line, they basically require two stop valves. One can be a non-return valve, and then they require what's called a free blow drain in valve in between those. Those free blow drain valves aren't connected to anything, but when you have your two steam valves in that free blow drain in between, basically what the reason is, so when you have a boiler manway, you have to isolate both of those valves before somebody crawls into that boiler, and you have to open that free blow drain valve that's in between those. So that if somebody crawls into that boiler through the manway, if they hear that valve, the free blow of the drain start to, you hear it basically forming a steam whistle. So if they hear that steam whistle start to go, they know to get the heck out of the boiler before the second valve fails. Another part, this is an efficiency enhancement for uh, high pressure steam boilers and an economizer. Most common uh, application is a feed water preheat for economizers and, and steam applications. This would basically be taking uh, the hot gas is coming off of the boiler. Again, if our 360 degree steam temperature, you know, we might have a 400 degree uh, stack temperature. We can run that into an economizer. The economizer basically takes some of the feed water, at least in a feed water application, takes some of the feed water, runs it through an economizer. The economizer preheats the feed water, decreases the stack temperature, and you recover some of those BTUs before that water goes in, gets fed back into the boiler. This is nice and it's a relatively inexpensive device. You can typically recover about three to 5% of your energy from your steam boiler system by adding an economizer, like a, a preheat, a feed water economizer into your system. And they typically have a payback even on 100 horsepower or 200 horsepower. The typical payback is 12 to 18 months for an economizer. So it really makes sense to look at this for your high pressure steam systems. There are other applications. If you have a facility where you're doing CIP or washdown, you can preheat your washdown, we can do uh, two-stage economizers to get condensing, and you can recover more heat out there in some of those different types of process facilities. Indicators of boiler effectiveness. We talked about earlier, the boiler is basically a heat exchanger. So some of the indicators of how effective that boiler is being, stack temperature. It indicates how effectively that heat exchanger works in transferring energy. If you're charting and trending that stack temperature over time, you can see as it starts to increase, you can see you're either getting bypass if it's a water tube, or um, you could start getting calcium buildup. Your tubes could be getting dirty. If that stack temperature started to increase, you know there's something going on in your boiler that might need to get a second look to increase that efficiency back to where it was. Stack oxygen, that indicates how effective the burner is at achieving proper combustion. Where are radiation losses? You don't want uh, where their insulation degrading over time because then you're going to get more heat bleeding into the room or your refractory could crack, other things like that. You have boiler standby and cycling losses. You must know all the parameters to gauge, gauge the true performance of your system. Uh, condensate pump sizing, another part of the steam system. We want to make sure that we're returning as much condensate back to that boiler feed system and continuing to reuse it. There's already a lot of energy in that higher temperature condensate. It's already been treated with water treatment chemicals. The more of that that you can reuse and recover, the higher efficient, the higher your system efficiency is going to be. So we're typically sizing each condensate pump. We typically have a small atmospheric receiver or pressurized receiver. And then we're sizing that pump on two to three times the evaporation rate or condensing rate for that heat exchanger or the steam use in that uh, application in that location and then we're pumping that back to the boiler house and then we're feeding that into our surge tank or the aerator uh, so we can reuse it back in our system table of heat and power 
One boiler horsepower equals 0 0.069 gallons per minute, or one boiler horsepower equals 33,475 BTUs per hour, or 34.5 pounds per hour of steam, and that's from and at zero PSI and 212 PS or degree feed water temperature, or 139.4 square feet of EDR. Condensate receiver sizing, we're sizing that receiver tank. Generally, that receiver is the same size and volume as the pumping rate. The customer has high pressure steam, high pressure returns. This may change due to the need of flash steam, or you might need a flash tank inside of your system, depending on how high pressure those returns are. But something we really have to evaluate how that steam is being used at that location uh, before sizing that condensate receiver. With that, that's the end. If there are any other questions, we're happy to answer them or we can follow up with the individual. I know a couple of you guys have asked for copies of the presentation. We can get those out to you. We will also be, we recorded this today. We will be sharing this on our YouTube channel, the DB Sales YouTube channel, as well as on the training section of our website. You'll be able to see the replay of these presentations. Not only today's presentations, but all the, the past weekly presentations Austin and our team have been putting together over the last few weeks. Uh, so with that, any other questions, uh, you know, please let us know. We're here to help you with your projects or uh, your service or any other things that, uh, that you might have. Let's see, we got a question coming in here. Uh, can I please have a copy of the presentation, not the recording, but the slide. We can get this off to you. This is from an anonymous attendee, so I don't know what your name is. You'll have to send us over uh, your contact information to get a copy of the presentation. Any other questions? Well, thank you everybody for joining in today. We had a good crowd again. Uh, let us know how we can help you with your projects or any other questions that you have coming up. We're, uh, we're happy to help and we're here to support you. Uh, let us know what we can do. Thank you.